Good afternoon from Gandangara Nara outside Sydney. I offer my gratitude and my sorry to the elders past, present and emerging in the Gandangara and Daruk people of the land where I live and work. A raft of countries around the world have now adopted the legal stance that a person can, by means of declaration, assign themselves the legal category of the opposite sex via a process called self-identification. We are told via our ACON impeded media that this is perfectly safe, uncontroversial, that only bigots would complain about such a state of affairs. Self-ID does, of course, affect the wish of women to call themselves men, as well as men to call themselves women. The greatest vulnerability in this, however, is that of girls and women when men are free to identify themselves into our spaces. So far, without official self-ID, those spaces include refuges, homeless shelters, sports, change rooms, toilets and prisons, but also other women's projects like literary and music prizes and art and film competitions. With self-ID, the capacity of women to challenge any of this will go. Once a man says he's a woman and the state supports him in this fraud, women may no longer have this right to any spaces. At this point, a lot of groups are already capitulating out of what we're told is kindness. Mm -hmm. Across Australia, governments following both the corporate push embodied in ACON and the direction of the Federal Anti-Discrimination Act have compromised women's single sex spaces. You will no doubt have heard of the loss to women of the MacIvers Ladies Baths, also known as the Coogee Women's Pool in Sydney. It was once open to all women and much beloved. Then men who had had genital surgery were allowed to attend and in recent times an uproar occurred and the current committee allowed men in without this proviso. The Sydney Morning Herald's Helen Pitt called this a victory lap for democracy in a very hard to read article because the definition of women was as fluid as the pool itself. It concluded that the new leadership group is already working with the trans community, the Muslim Women's Association, the Council of Jewish Women and the Swifts netball team mm -hmm. to make the pool as welcoming as possible. It is hard to see how Muslim and Jewish women can accommodate men in the space they intend to swim. I guess most will just miss out. Being kind only goes one way. In Tasmania, we have seen a lesbian woman told it is discriminatory for her to want to have an event for lesbian women. Lesbians must now include men in their dating pools and organisations. Some have capitulated and some have gone underground. It is a sad day at a time when teenaged girls need lesbian visibility, women cannot safely provide it. A Melbourne shelter for women escaping male violence in the home just announced they will accept trans identifying men as clients and workers. In 1995, this shelter sought to use the single sex exemptions of the state's anti-discrimination laws to have a women only service. We have some stealth self ID in Australia, given the changes in various jurisdictions to how a person can go about changing their identification documents with very little bother. In Victoria, for instance, the kind birth certificates were heralded with great fanfare, with really only the Victorian Women's Guild objecting. The Victorian one is a good model to see how Australian self-ID might work. Originally, in order to rewrite one's birth history, only people who had had surgery to alter their genitals into a facsimile of the opposite sex were able to apply. This then required proof from doctors that you had had the requisite alterations to your body. The current regime requires a statutory declaration that you are in fact the opposite sex and proof from another person. You can change your birth history no more than once a year, which is a curious comment on something we're told is immutable. Of course, the person who has had the risky genital surgery and the person who write the stat deck have something in common they're still the sex they've always been. Both, however, are then legally entitled to enter spaces which have been designated for the sole use of one sex. It creates risky territory for women and girls to have males now legally entitled to use our spaces. 
It's been well documented for decades that most violence and the most violent of that violence is perpetrated by men. It's estimated that 91% of victims of rape and sexual assault are female and 9% male. However, nearly 99% of perpetrators are male. Allowing men to self-identify into the legal category of women could begin to shift how that looks. And this violence is one of the reasons prisons are single sex. Women in prisons are, in many ways, a particularly vulnerable group of women. Debbie Kilroy's research on women done 20 years ago indicated 98% of women prisoners had experienced physical abuse and 89% had experienced sexual abuse. She also reported that between 70 and 80% of women in adult prisons in Queensland were survivors of incest. Deprivation of liberty and the experience of the legal system and corrective services are in and of themselves traumatic. Most women are not in the system because of violent crimes, but crimes of poverty. Many are mothers, some have babies with them. A far higher proportion than the wider community have mental illnesses and substance issues. Even more women are on remand than are sentenced. Most people in prison have been victims of male violence, whether male or female. Most have the criminogenic factors in their backgrounds of coming from poverty, being young, being the child of prisoners themselves, or being Aboriginal. Aboriginal women are the fastest growing group of new prisoners in Australia. Already traumatised women do not need the omnipresent fear of men in their cells. At various times in the late 1990s and early 2000s, corrective services housed men claiming to be women in women's prison. One of the notorious New South Wales cases was of a man called Noel Crompton Hall, who murdered another man in a drug dispute and was given a life sentence for the brutality of the crime. Mm -hmm. Noel claimed he was Madison in 1999 and asked to be moved to the women's prison, Mullawa. Mm -hmm. The Serious as Offences Management Committee agreed to the move. Hall was also HIV positive and being given oestrogen. While in Mullawa, he's alleged to have raped his cellmate and sexually assaulted other women. He was then moved back into the men's prison where he tried to swap drugs for sex with other inmates. Hall sued New South Wales Corrective Services for discriminating against him because he was transgender and HIV positive. He was awarded an out-of-court settlement of $25,000. Reverend Fred Nile raised this man's case at the time in the New South Wales Parliament, asking if it was commonplace for the government to facilitate sex change operations for prisoners and if the government would undertake to keep such men out of women's prisons. Mm -hmm. The then responsible minister, Tony Kelly, reported that the woman who had sought to bring charges had left the country on release, so the case did not proceed. He took Nile's other questions under advisement. Hall was also raised in the New South Wales Parliament in relation to alterations to the births, deaths and marriages registration amendment called the Change of Name Bill. The debate was around closing loopholes which allowed violent offenders to change their names and secure a new identity upon release, something which is a concerning possibility with self-ID as well. In 2001, after psychiatric assessment, Hall's life sentence was cut to 22 years with a 16-year non-parole period. In 2003, while still in prison, he spent the $25,000 on genital surgery. He was released in April 2010 with a job and accommodation waiting for him and his new name and appearance. He died sometime in 2019. It is apparent that other males were in the women's division at the same time as he. Research about men who claim special identities in prison is heavily biased. Hall's treatment by these researchers is generally very sympathetic. In 2004, Richard Edney suggested that empirical evidence suggests that the level of protection is not of such quality as to guarantee the basic human rights of transgender persons while in custody. The Australian Human Rights Commission claims these men are more likely than the general population to experience assault and self-harm and that these vulnerabilities are magnified when transgender persons are incarcerated. 
This appears to be extrapolated from the poorly evidenced surveys we so often see when discussing men with special identities. Lynch and Bartels writing in 2017 use, for instance, the trans pathways suicide statistics drawn from 859 self-reporting young people aged 14 to 25 to extrapolate that trans identifying males in prisons are at higher risk of suicide than the general population. This survey has been utterly debunked by people like Bernard Lane. There is also the tragic case of a trans identifying woman who asked to be put in the women's prison and was refused. She suicided after being raped. And an Aboriginal trans identifying male who research has used to promote the myth of transgender suicide rather than the reality of Aboriginal deaths in custody. The research also contains the same obfuscation and assumptions as all the other claims about trans identifying males. Access to medical care is a crisis in Australian prisons. Prisoners, male and female, die from lack of care. This is absolutely something about which governments should care. Demands for trans health care, though, are not for basic health care. It's for the commencement of hormones and genital surgery. It is clear that for most of the 21st century, there has been no consistent count of prisoners with special identities. Given that it is impossible to define these identities, this is hardly surprising. So none of the research to ameliorate the conditions of these prisoners can name how many there are, but can state with certainty that they are each experiencing egregious human rights abuses. Corrective services manuals in each state have long lists of rules for supporting these inmates. Research about how women in prison will fare with male prisoners locked in with them is non-existent. It wasn't done before the experiment commenced. We are seeing women speaking up in other countries though, and the marvellous Keep Prisons Single Sex Project in Western Australia. Women around the world held vigils and protests on International Women's Day this year in support of the rights of women in prison to single sex spaces. It is curious logic to say that this group of men are at risk in men's prisons and the only possible solution is to place those men with women. Trans identifying males have been placed in segregation in Australia, but this is considered a human rights abuse because they're isolated from the general population. Placing them in with the general population is also considered an abuse of their human rights. In today's privatised prisons, it seems odd that they're not building wings for specific prisoners, be they federal prisoners inside for welfare fraud or trans identifying prisoners. This week in the UK, another aspect of the farcical nature of the legal fiction, which is self ID, has been revealed. An aristocrat with a gender recognition certificate, which makes him legally a woman, has put in a bid to join the House of Lords in his capacity as a hereditary peer. He has an older sister. In the modernised laws of the UK, as they are both female, the older sister could now inherit the peerage. However, written into the GRC rules are that being legally a woman doesn't remove his right to inherit as the oldest male child. And a trans identifying woman in a family with a hereditary peerage can't legally assume the title, even though she is legally a man. It's curious to note how moneyed interests still manage to recognise sex when it matters. As a final point, it is worth mentioning Malta. Like a lot of countries, Malta has embraced gender identity and pushed through self ID laws for the benefit of men. After introducing sex self-ID in 2015, ILGA, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender and Intersex Association, commends Malta because for the seventh year in a row, Malta has the number one spot on the Rainbow Europe map. The Maltese self-ID law was pushed through in a forced teaming manoeuvre, using people with differences of sexual development as the human shield and without consultation. Women's rights in Malta are not rated highly. Maltese women are unable to access abortion for any reason. It is utterly illegal. Even Polish women can access abortion if the health of the woman is endangered or the pregnancy is the result of rape. 
Malta, with a population of half a million people, has four shelters for women fleeing male violence in the home with a total of 41 beds. Malta's criminal code considers rape a crime against the peace and honour of families, and rape is generally prosecuted only by complaint of the victim. Malta struggles with endemic political corruption and violence, with journalists and politicians who ask the wrong questions being murdered. The rights of Maltese women are well behind those of Maltese men who can now declare themselves women and take one of those 41 beds if they so choose. It is abundantly clear that allowing men to identify into women's single sex spaces harms women. We have an upcoming election in New South Wales, so it's time to get out there and find the brave and stunning politicians who will speak for women. Thank you.